Okay, good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum, Chair of the Committee on Finance. Today's hearing is being held jointly with the Committee on Governmental Operations, which is chaired by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. Uh, we are joined today by Councilmember Rory Lantzman, uh, M Minority Leader Steve Matteo, Councilmember Farrah Lewis, uh, I said Councilmember Cabrera already, Councilmember Barry Grugensha, Councilmember Council Member, uh, Antonio Reynoso as well. Uh, New York City is home to thousands of not-for-profit organizations that deliver critical programs and services to the communities throughout the five boroughs, provide for our residents' spiritual and religious needs, and do countless hours of charitable work. The not-for-profit sector is significant in the city's economy. As of 2017, New York City had the highest number of not-for-profit sector jobs in the state, with over 662,000 employees at an average wage of $63,000. Given the sector's importance in the city, it is key to understand the ongoing challenges many of these organizations face and to maintain a commitment to provide support to these vital partners through the access to helpful resources citywide. Today's hearing and the bills we are considering is aimed at encouraging city government to look at the not-for-profit sector holistically rather than taking an agency-by-agency -agency approach. Much like how EDC and SBS work to study and bring solutions to many sectors across the business industries, the administration should focus on not-for-profits in a similar manner. I commend the Finance Commissioner, Jacques Gia, for taking the first step towards that goal. Under his leadership, DOF launched a not-for-profit task force comprised of representatives of the mayor, the city council, and members of the not-for-profit community aimed at connecting not-for-profit prof property owners across the city with local government resources. More specifically, the task force focused on addressing several issues, largely related to the lack of clarity, information, coordination, and outreach about the not-for-profit property tax exemptions, the lien sale, charges imposed by the New York City Fire Department, water and sewer exemptions administered by DEP, and waivers of Department of Building inspection fees. As a result of the collaborative efforts of this task force and of the work of the bill's prime sponsors, we have four pieces of legislation before us today that would ease some of the bureaucracy created by the city and create a single point of contact for not-for-profits to engage with city government and access the many resources we have to offer. The three bills that are in the Finance Committee are, one, uh, proposed intro 245A, sponsored by Councilmember Reynoso, which would require DOF to create a not-for-profit ombudsman per, uh, position, exempt certain property that received a not-for-profit tax exemption within the prior two years from the tax lien sale, exempt property from tax lien sale where the owner has, in good faith, submitted an application for the not-for-profit property tax exemption with DOF, provide notice to class four property owners about exemptions and other actions to remove a property from the tax lien sale and include information on how to remove a property from the tax lien sale when denying applications for certain exemptions. Uh, two, intro 1776, sponsored by Council Member Ayala, which would require DOF and DEP to develop a single application form for the not-for-profit property tax exemption, the exemption from water and sewer charges, and any other exemptions from municipal charges and fees which may apply to not-for-profits. And three, intro 1799, sponsored by Council Member Rivera, which would require DOF to create a guide for not-for-profit organizations with information about relevant exemptions, waivers, permits and registrations, and the tax lien sale. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Chair Cabrera. Uh, he wants to give, you want to make your statement first? Yeah. Okay, okay, very good. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. Thank you to Chairman Drum and the Finance Committee staff for organizing this hearing on how the city can improve its relationships with New York City's robust and diverse not-for-profit sector. It is very important that the city be mindful of policies that stifle the work of not-for-profit, that we do everything we can to eliminate barriers that distract not-for-profits from the vital role, vital work improving the lives of individuals, families, and communities. As 
will be discussed in detail during the, this hearing. The city already offered various information, training, financial resources to local not-for-profits. The city also solicited feedback from the not-for-profit sector through various forums. Still, we can and should do more to ensure easy communication between the city and not-for-profits so we can be flexible and respond to fluctuations, including changes to state and federal law that impact not-for-profit work. To that end, among the bills to be heard today is Introduction 1784, sponsored by my colleague, Councilmember Ferrer Lewis. This bill will, be, will require the mayor to establish an office of not-for-profit services to offer as a liaison to not-for-profit organizations in relation to policies and regulations, contracting and funding opportunities and programs and benefits affecting their sector. This office will advise the mayor and the city agencies on policies affecting not-for-profits, <coughs> excuse me, an annual, an, annual, annual, an annual report on recommendations to improve the well-being of a not-for-profit sector. I would like to thank uh, government operations staff, committee counsel Daniel Collins, policy analyst Elizabeth Cronk, and Emily Forjom and finance analyst Sebastian Bacci, and as well as my own legislative communications director, Claire McLevain. I would now like to recognize Councilmember Lewis for an opening statement. Let me just say that this is her very first bill. Well, congratulations. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Chair Drum and Chair uh, Cabrera for the opportunity to discuss this bill. And I wanna thank my colleagues, um, Councilmember Reynoso, Rivera, and Ayala for joining this package of bills. Yeah, that's probably easier. Thank you so much. Across New York City, nonprofit organizations are on the ground doing vitally important work in schools, senior centers, and other public spaces to provide services our constituents rely on every day. I am intimately familiar with the challenges these nonprofits face in New York City. As a former budget director, I know of many other staffers that I've worked with in the past at the council and local nonprofits that shared the same experiences I had, which was basically spending a great deal of time helping disgruntled leaders from nonprofit organizations to get access to appropriate contacts at city agencies to navigate how to access funding RFPs and other award opportunities as well as pulling down funding. Navigating these issues takes valuable time that our offices and these nonprofits could have been using in order to better serve our districts. This body could not function without these organizations. Some of them we may be familiar with, Brooklyn Arts Council, Wildcat, Family Justice Center, just to name a few. I believe that these nonprofits and many others have a responsibility to clear the path for individuals and groups seeking to make New York City a better place. Intro 1784 will establish an office that will provide guaranteed services to nonprofits seeking to incorporate and those already providing services citywide and within our districts to better serve our communities. This office will function as a liaison between nonprofits and city agencies that will work to devise solutions to roadblocks and keep this body, as well as the mayor, in form of challenges nonprofits might be facing. And it will be required to report on this activity yearly. I'm glad to see this piece of legislation move forward along some of the other vital important bills introduced by my colleagues today, creating opportunities for nonprofits to thrive. Thank you, Chairs Drum and Cabrera, and the council and council members Reynoso and Rivera Ayala for your partnership on this issue. And I wanna thank the nonprofit organizations that are here today and those that are supporting this movement in order for us to stand and work together to build a greater New York City. Thank you. Well, very good, we'll now hear from council member Reynoso. With uh, gratitude to the chairs and also to uh, Councilmember Luis Rivera Ayala for uh, the work in ensuring that we take care of the not for profits in our in our city that do such great work. Uh, the bill that I'm uh, that we're hearing today, Intro 245, that I'm sponsoring, uh, provides exemptions from the tax lien sales list for nonprofits that are in the process of securing a tax exemption and requires that the city better inform nonprofits about how they can stay off the list and the potential consequences if they do end up on the list. Um, I have more, uh, more comments, but I just wanted to speak to uh, a couple of examples of what uh, some of these organizations are going through. 
uh, Haven Ministries in Far Rockaway was unaware that they were even on the ta city's tax lien sales list and would have gone into foreclosure if it wasn't for 596 acres. Someone else's mic is on? Is somebody else's mic on? The feedback. Oh, I apologize, sorry. <laughs> Another organization is the Al Munir Foundation, who, which is a mosque and a community center in Jamaica, Queens. They were denied exemptions every year from 2011 to 2015. The foreclosure was initiated. They had to pay $32,370 to the Department of Finance and also spent $26,000 in legal fees. Um, we all know what $60,000 means to a not-for-profit and a community center. And the last one is the Mary Mitchell Center, a community center in Crotona, Bronx, um, who is in the process, or actually is not in the process anymore, but their exemption was denied and they had to pay DOF $2,552 to stay out of the 2018 lien sale. Um, so just examples of these not-for-profits that are being caught up in bureaucracy and red tape that we could do, we could do better. Um, so thank you again to the chairs. Uh, okay, thank you. We'll now hear from uh, Councilmember Rivera. Thank you, Chairs Jerome and Cabrera, for allowing me to speak today and for holding this important hearing. And I have to thank uh, Councilmembers Reynoso, Ayala, and Councilmember Farrah Lewis for their leadership in moving this legislative package forward. So the bills we are hearing today will help relieve the financial and administrative burdens that our city's nonprofits have been forced to take on by our outdated tax and city finance system. As a former community organizer, nonprofit employee, council staffer, and now council member, I have seen the critical impact that these safe and very much sacred spaces play in housing, healthcare, education, the arts, and social services, both in my district and throughout the five boroughs. I have also unfortunately seen many of our city's nonprofit providers crumble under financial duress and complicated bureaucracy, leaving our communities without the resources they need to thrive. The package of legislation which includes my bill intro 1799 is simplifying our oftentimes confusing and unwelcoming finance system for our nonprofit organizations. Under intro 1799, the Department of Finance will be mandated to create and distribute information on tax exemptions, funding applications, and other resources for nonprofits. This legislation will allow nonprofits to navigate government channels with greater ease and streamline their funding process. The fact of the matter is many of these organizations are operated by overworked staffers and volunteers, many of whom lack training in complicated finance and tax law. Organizations are already struggling to keep their lights on as they apply for funding and support and as a legislative body, we need to make sure our finance laws uplift rather than penalize them. That, that's why I'm proud to support this package of legislation that will increase transparency while making it easier for nonprofits to focus on their missions as service providers. And I look forward to this discussion today and moving these important changes forward. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you very much. And before I finish up here, I want to say we've been joined by council members Kalos Koslowitz Jaeger. Cumbo and Van Bramer as well. Now, before we hear testimony, I'd like to thank the Finance Committee staff who worked on today's hearing, Rebecca Chasen, Emra Adev, Stephanie Ruiz, Andrew Wilbur, and Masi Sarkissian. We will now begin with testimony from Jeffrey Shear, Deputy Commissioner of Treasury and Payment Services at the Department of Finance, and Ted Olbermann, Director of Commercial Exemptions and Abatements at the Department of Finance, followed by testimony from Jennifer Geeling, Deputy Director for Policy and Partnership at the Mayor's Office of Contracts, Contract Services. Andrew uh, Reddick from the Department of Environmental Protection is also here to answer any questions we may have for DEP. Uh, so I'm going to ask Council to uh, swear in the panel. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful is the best for your knowledge, information, and belief? Thank you. Okay, and you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Drum, Chair Cabrera, and members of the City Council Finance Committee and Government Operations Committee. My name is Jeffrey Shear, and I am Deputy Commissioner for Treasury and Payment Services <coughs> at the New York City Department of Finance, DOF. I am here today to testify on three bills related to not-for-profit NFP organizations. They are Intro 245A, Intro 1776, and Intro 1799. I am joined today 
by Jennifer Geiling, Deputy Director, Policy and Partnerships from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services to testify on intro 1784, as well as by Andrew Reddig, Chief of Revenue Protection for the Bureau of Customer Services for the Department of Environmental Protection, and Ted Oberman, um, who is Director of Commercial Exemptions from DOF's Property Exemption Administration to help me answer your questions. I'd like to start off by talking about the great work DOF has done in the past few years to engage the NFP community and ensure more NFPs renew their property exemptions on time. Through DOF's outreach, including an NFP portal, letters, and follow-up calls, we have achieved a 99% renewal rate for the past two years, which reflects an average of 13,000 renewals per year and an average of 92 non-responders. This means NFPs do not have to file a new application and their exemption has no break in period benefit. While we are pleased that the vast majority of NFPs renew their exemptions through this process, it is also important to point out that many of the non-responders have their exemptions renewed during the tax lien sale process. To further support our services to NFPs, DOF is looking into other mechanisms that could grant an exemption for non-responders that would have been eligible on the taxable status date up to th the three preceding years. In addition, in October 2018, DOF launched our NFP task force to hear from advocates and NFP representatives about the challenges they face when applying for or renewing any city exemption. The task force meets about three times a year and we are pleased that the Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, MOX, the Department of Buildings, DOB, and Council Finance staff have joined us for these meetings. One of the recommendations and concrete outcomes from this task force is a draft NFP brochure for those seeking to apply for DOF NFP exemptions. Intro 245A relates to NFPs and the DOF tax lien sale process. DOF broadly supports 245A, which aligns with our efforts to improve the customer service and flexibility of the tax lien sale process and codifies existing DOF practices. DOF also is asking the council to make some minor changes to the bill. State law exempts NFPs from paying property taxes if they annually confirm their not-for-profit status and show that they are using their property for an exempt purpose. In recent years, DOF has made great efforts to make the NFP exemption process as easy as possible. DOF realizes that many NFPs are small organizations staff with part-time and or volunteer workers that may find the exemption process challenging, especially when there has been turnover in the NFP's leadership. That is why we established the previously described NFP portal, why we sponsor about 100 community outreach events a year, and why we launched our NFP task force. However, DOF recognizes that for the small number of NFPs that fail to renew their exemption and wind up in the tax lien sale process, special attention is needed. That is why DOF's current practice is to remove an NFP from the tax lien sale at-risk pool if it has received a previous exemption and submits an exemption for the current year that is substantially complete. Intro 245A creates a not-for-profit ombudsperson position within DOF, excludes properties from the tax lien sale if their owner has received a not-for-profit exemption in one of the two previous fiscal years, removes properties from the tax lien sale at-risk pool if they have made a good faith NFP application, and requires information on how to avoid having one's tax lien sold in NFP exemption denial letters. The ombudsperson position is aligned with DOF's creation of the Taxpayer Advocates Office, which already has been handling these types 
of issues that 245 highlights as needing an ombudsperson. DOF already excludes properties from the tax lien sale if the owner has received an NFP exemption in the prior fiscal year and is amenable to also looking at the prior fiscal year before that in making this determination. DOF also removes properties from the tax lien sale at risk pool if the owner has filed a good faith renewal application. And DOF agrees it is a good idea for NFP exemption denial letters to contain comprehensive information relating to the tax lien sale. DOF is proposing minor changes to the bill to the council. These include limiting the good faith application provision to organizations that have previously obtained an NFP exemption, authorizing DOF to include a property with a previous NFP exemption in the tax lien sale if DOF has information that the organization has ceased to operate and not delaying the sale of a tax lien that pertains to debt that may have been incurred prior to the acquisition of the property by the NFP unless the NFP is pursuing actions to address the lien. Also, DOF finds it challenging to apply the provisions of the bill retroactively for reporting purposes and requests that the council rely on the already extensive reporting that we perform on properties with previous NFP exemptions that are at risk of having their tax lien sold. Intro 1776. This legislation requires the Department of Finance to work with the Department of Environmental Protection to develop a single application form that not-for-profit organizations can submit to apply for both the not-for-profit real property tax exemption and the not-for-profit water and sewer charge exemption at the same time. We fully support the Council's goal of making the application process as simple as possible for NFPs. We do not believe that creating one form for two separate processes is the best way to do that. NFP exemptions for DOF and DEP are established by different state laws, which have different information requirements and standards. Some NFPs qualify for DOF exemptions, but not for DEP exemptions. Requiring all applicants to apply for both through a combined application would create more of a burden for NFPs than only qualify for a DOF exemption. This burden would be felt during the initial application process and during the annual renewal process. Also, the DOF process is run annually, whereas the DEP process is conducted every other year. A combined form would likely lead to NFP submitting information to DEP when it was not required. DEP and DOF are committed to improving the application process, and we are happy to work with the Council to do so. Intro 1799. This legislation requires the Department of Finance to create and publish an informational brochure with information that would be useful to NFPs, including information about relevant taxes and exemption. DOF supports this legislation and already has made significant progress in this area. As a part of the DOF NFP task force, DOF has recently completed the final draft of a brochure on NFP exemptions. A copy of the draft is attached to this testimony. In addition, DOF has property tax guides that include information about the notice of property value, the assessment process, exemptions and abatements, and how to appeal an exemption. DOF is currently updating these documents and is happy to consider including additional information relating to NFP, NFPs that is suggested by the Council. We would like to note that assessments do not change if a property is owned by an NFP. Rather, the NFP can apply for an exemption from real property taxes or water meter taxes for their property. Intro 1784. As mentioned earlier, our colleague Jennifer Geiling from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services will testify in this legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. 
Um, next. Good afternoon, Chair Drum, Chair Cabrera, and members of the City Council Finance Committee and Governmental Operations Committee. Also, good afternoon, Chair Kalos of the Contracts Committee. My name is Jennifer Geiling, and I am the Deputy Director for Policy and Partnerships at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, MOX, and the Executive Director of the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, NRC. I am joining the Department of Finance today to share how the administration is partnering with and supporting the city's critical health and human service, HHS, nonprofit organizations. This administration deeply values the role that nonprofits play in delivering vital services to our city's communities, including our most vulnerable populations. As our PowerPoint indicates, We can get this to work here. Sorry, please bear with me. Okay. We'll make, yeah. As our PowerPoints indicates here, there is no question that the health and well-being of our city is directly tied to the health and well-being of our nonprofits. In recognition of this significant partnership, the administration launched the NRC in September 2016 as a centralized body to hear directly from nonprofits about operational challenges and then to design and implement sector-wide solutions with and for those same partners. As I will share in this testimony, Intro 1784 captures the spirit and the work of the NRC. As such, we support institutionalizing the NRC and look forward to working with you and our partners to define the right structure to continue this meaningful work. We appreciate the flexibility provided by the current draft of the legislation. In the three years since its inception, the NRC has established itself as a center for purposeful engagement and policy reform that translates into results-oriented action. More than 100 nonprofit organizations volunteer to participate in our work, representing the diversity of the sector with a range in organization size, contracting portfolios, service areas, and populations served. The NRC has galvanized government leaders who oversee procurement, finance, programs, and audit across the city's 40 mayoral agencies and the Department of Education. All key HHS agencies are active participants in the committee's work, specifically the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, Department for the Aging, DIFTA, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, Department of Social Services, DSS, and the Administration for Children's Services, ACS. Together, our city leaders work hand in hand with nonprofit leaders to understand the everyday challenges of delivering services in a city of this size and operating businesses subject to disparate policies and practices across 41 agencies and hundreds of programs. We roll up our sleeves to do the hard work of unpacking difficult and long-standing problems, identifying opportunities for mutually beneficial change, and rebuilding policies and practices that can be effectively implemented and maintained. By inviting nonprofits to co-design the solutions to their challenges, we create reforms that make sense and can be successfully adopted. This is a flagship model of partnership that is enabled through nurturing honest and transparent conversations and building trust and understanding. Through this open and committed dialogue, we have completed a range of pro projects that support our, our diverse sector and make it easier to do business with the City of New York. Initiatives are identified by providers and target opportunities to streamline administrative practices, 
collaborate on program design, and build organizational financial strength. We are accountable to the sector and cultivate transparency and accessibility through publicly sharing our activities and adopted reforms on our website at nyc.gov backslash NRC. As you can see, the accomplishments we highlight reflect years of hard work to get the details of each initiative right, and hundreds of meetings to ensure we are hearing each other and developing relevant tools and policies that benefit the sector. After years of collaboration, we now have a body of work we can all be proud of, and providers are experiencing legitimate relief in many areas. That said, the initiatives that gather the most attention are those that focus on fiscal reforms, funding, more flexibility with funding, and receiving funding earlier. I'd like to highlight four significant achievements in this area, which in fiscal year 2020, FY20, have come together to significantly strengthen the business environment for the city's HHS nonprofit sector. First, FY20 saw the city's successful implementation of the NRC's policy for timely contract registration. This fiscal year, more than 80% of July 1st HHS contracts were ready for registration on time across our HHS agencies. Let me underscore this statement. This fiscal year, more than 80% of July 1st HHS contracts were ready for registration on time across our HHS agencies. As you know, late registration is a long-standing pain point for this sector. This accomplishment was a breakthrough initiative with critical financial implications, targeting cash flow and greater liquidity. Established through an NRC working group, city agencies and nonprofit providers co-designed the registration process to initiate document collection and review earlier in the fiscal year and leverage HHS accelerator technology to streamline practices. We centralized communications through HHS accelerator document vault, consolidated practices, and reduced duplication. The net result was more than 80% of July 1st HHS contracts ready for registration on time across our HHS agencies. Just this month, city agencies launched the FY21 registration process using the same model. Next year, we expect even stronger results, further increasing the number of contracts ready for FY21 registration on time. Timely registration enables providers to maximize a second NRC policy of 25% advances on all HHS annual budgets. For FY20, this means that the city paid nonprofits nearly $1 billion in advance payments in the first quarter of the fiscal year. For those who are unfamiliar with this issue, as a result of the NRC's work, nonprofits now receive upfront dollars to cover startup and future expenses and maintain steady cash flow. NRC policies further enable nonprofit financial management and planning through digital, centralized, and standard contract management practices. In FY20, budgeting, invoicing, and advance payments all happen more simply and quickly with a third NRC accomplishment, universal adoption of HHS Accelerator Financials the city's electronic budgeting and invoicing platform for HHS contracts. This year, for the first time, over 90% of all eligible budgets are flowing through this digital system. Providers now have the transparency and consistency they have long requested. Finally, the city established a standardized policy on indirect cost rates through the HHS Cost Policy and Procedure Manual, the Cost Manual. The cost manual was developed through the NRC and forms the foundation of a monumental commitment by the City Council and the administration to fund indirect cost rates effective this fiscal year. 
There are numerous other accomplishments, including guidebooks on best practices for program development and RFP design, work that was co-chaired by NYC Opportunity, a founding leader of the NRC, streamlining subcontracting processes to enable greater accessibility for small nonprofits, and revising the standard human service contracts to create a more equitable partnership. Our work is applicable across all HHS contracts, regardless of the contracting agency, impacting nearly $7 billion and more than 3,000 contracts annually. I'm happy to discuss these initiatives during our question and answer period and invite you to review our work at nyc.gov backslash NRC. While there is still more work to be done, the robust and fruitful collaboration between the administration and the nonprofit sector through the NRC is helping to establish a more supportive and sustainable operating environment for our critical HHS providers. And the work has been continuous since we launched, ongoing even as we sit here today. Current NRC workgroups are focused on enhancing equity and access for community-based organizations, integrating a justice-informed lens into programs and services, and expanding the guides to collaborative communication and standardized audits. Because of our rapid deployment of policy reform, small, medium, and large nonprofit organizations are already feeling shifts in their relationships with the city and greater financial stability. Under the current structure, MOX remains committed to fulfilling its NRC management role and will continue to launch new solutions like the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal, Passport, which ensures a predictable and transparent procurement experience. Intro 1784 captures the spirit and the work of the NRC, collaborating to identify and solve operational challenges critical to nonprofits, facilitating conversations between agencies and providers, and creating useful supports and resources that empower nonprofit organizations in their relationship with the city. We support institutionalizing the NRC and look forward to working with you and our partners to define the right structure to continue this meaningful work. We appreciate the flexibility provided by the current draft of the legislation, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay, good, thank you very much. Um, let me just start off with a question. Ms. Geiling, I hope I said your last name right. Geiling, Ms. Geiling. yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, in your testimony, you said that the registration is um, on time uh, across the HH agencies. What does on time mean? At the comptroller by July 1st. At the what? At the comptroller by July 1st. Okay. Um, let me go now to just talk a little bit about property tax exemptions and the city's tax lien sale. Uh, we know that the um, not-for-profit organizations are eligible to receive a property tax exemption and exemptions from other municipal charges such as water and sewer charges and fire code inspection fees. Uh, what are other examples of exemptions or waivers, both tax and non-tax related, that are available to not-for-profit organizations? Um, I'm not aware of uh, other charges which would be exempt besides the besides real estate taxes, water and sewer and fire department, um, building inspection, cleanup fees. Oh. Can you state your name yeah. for the record? Yeah, and I think we have to swear you in. Theodore Oberman. Okay. Affirm that. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best for your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Please state your name for the record. Theodore Oberman. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, there, there, are no other, there are no other charges that would be exempt from this. Sanitation, DOB, ECB, those would be required. Um, those would be fees that the not-for-profit would have to pay if they were assessed those charges. Can you provide the council with a list of those organizations? Uh, we could, yes. Okay, could, we'd like to have that. Uh, when the city sells a tax lien that is invalid, void, or defective, the Commissioner of Finance may either buy the lien back from the lien sale trust, uh, substitute another lien 
for the invalid lien or a combination of the two. Um, in the last five years, how many liens has the city either had to buy back or substitute? I don't have those figures with me, but we'll provide them. Of, um, when the city buys back a lien from the trust, does it have to pay more than the amount initially paid by the trust to the city to purchase the lien in the first place? If so, how much? So it, it depends uh, on how far it, it's gone. I don't, I, I would have to be, a, I don't have numbers with me, but we can provide you with um, general guidelines. And sometimes there is interest uh, charges on those lien sales that have to be paid by the city? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, if a not-for-profit has not applied for or renewed a property tax exemption, even though it is eligible, if it does eventually file an application, how many years back can the exemption be applied? Well, um, it, it depends. It depends on when the property is purchased. Um, so um, real property tax law section 494A allows us to uh, grant an exemption back to the date of deed provided that the property is purchased <coughs> prior, I'm sorry, after August 1st, 2007. Um, if, there are, uh, if the property was purchased prior to that, we can really only go to the date of application um, generally. Um, there may be other circumstances. We do need to look and see what the usage is of the property during that time. And, and there is a process that we have to, you know, go through with the applicant to determine the use of the property during that interim period. Okay. Um, single application for exemptions. Um, I know that you said it would be problematic, but what happens if a not-for-profit is late in applying for a renewal to either DOF or DEP? Is there a grace period to file the deadline? To file after the deadline? The deadline um, is January 5th, uh, which is the taxable status date. Um, during the renewal processes, we've extended the deadline um, as late as May 1st. Um, if a NFP did not file a renewal for the upcoming tax year, so the, the current renewal is for the 2021 tax year, um, we allow them one of two things. They can either file a new application, in which case we'll review that, and if they're approved, we would apply it um, retroactive to July 1st. We also let them file a renewal application the next year, and if they're approved, we would we would um, reinstate the the current tax year, which at, at this point would be 2021. And, and if I could speak to DEP, uh, the you just state your name. Also. I'm sorry, I'm Andrew Reddig. I'm the chief of revenue protection uh, at DEP. Uh, the revocation letter that would go to a not-for-profit stating that the uh, because of a failure to respond and recertify would lead to a revocation, there is then a 30-day grace period even within that letter. And then if shortly thereafter, even if the property had then been revoked, um, they then got the application in, we would then just just uh, sort of waive any, you know, if there was, a, let's say, one quarterly bill had come in, we, 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 would, we would remove that. So there, there is certainly a Do you know how many um, not-for-profits fall off the, um, the exemptions, the exemption roll annually? For failure to renew or for because they're sold? For failure to renew. So the last two years it's been under 100 each year. Um, that's, that's out of about 13,000 renewals that we, we sent out. Yeah. Okay. Um, have uh, either DOF or DE, DEP investigated what may be causing the organizations to not maintain their exemption status with the agencies? Do you have any idea of why that happens? So I, I can answer for DEP. Um, as very close to 100% of the uh, entities that, are, that have their exemptions revoked are revoked for one of two reasons. 
One is that there is a problem with the plumbing at the facility. They don't have a meter, the, the, plumb, the, the, the pipes are illegal, that needs to be fixed, and the entity then doesn't fix that condition, which means they lose the exemption. The other reason uh, is residential spaces. When we discovered that there are apartments uh, in these facilities, we are required to then revoke unless those, facility, those apartments are separately metered. So it's for one of those two reasons, and it's as close to 100% uh, of, of the reason uh, as you can get. And what about for DOF? Um, well, sometimes for, for people who failed to renew, it could be because there's been a change in the administrator who handles this. A lot of times these are very small churches. Um, the, the pastor dies or the person who was in charge of it has moved on. Uh, it could be because the property has been sold and the new owner is not aware that there is a renewal. Um, and I, I, I really can't answer. Th that's the majority of the ones that we've seen for non-responders. Right. Uh, I would just add that um, sometimes the organization has ceased to operate. And, and frankly, sometimes it's difficult for us to discern whether um, we have simply been unable to get in touch for, for the reasons that, that Ted has given. There's been a change, a move, um, but sometimes it, it ha has ceased to operate. Sometimes also there's a change in the use of the property. So it, it isn't uncommon for uh, a not-for-profit or religious organization, um, for example, to um, lease certain floors on the property, um, or if they own a, a parking lot, to have the parking lot commercially developed so the lot would no longer be eligible um, because it's not being used for an exempt purpose. So it's a variety of those things and it's sometimes challenging for us um, because we are doing all this outreach. We're talking about the last 1%. Um, sometimes we don't know the full story and we very much are anxious to, to find out what it is. In, in what ways does DOF and DEP collaborate to conduct outreach to uh, ensure that eligible organizations receive the benefits that they are entitled to? Do you want to answer that question? Sure. So um, as part of the uh, not-for-profit task force, um, uh, of which DEP is also a, a critical member, uh, we have started to, on all of our approval letters, indicate in, in, in language that the, the exemption is specifically for real estate taxes. It's not for DEP char um, any DEP charges, and they should apply to DEP. Uh, in addition, on our renewal approvals, which come out in June um, pr prior to the tax year, we also have language um, to that effect. Um, that's that, and we also now receive, um, or have been receiving, um, on a sort of monthly or week. I, I think it's a weekly basis. I'm sorry, a request from DEP to determine if the property is tax exempt from the Department of Finance, which is used in their criteria for evaluation. I, I would just add that there are also outreaches throughout the year. Uh, either through not-for-profits or religious organizations um, sponsored by, by council members that uh, are attended by both DEP and DOF to explain our different processes and, and how they, uh, the applicants can complete the applications. Do you work with other agencies like the uh, FDNY or um, DOB um, to do outreach to uh, these nonprofits? Yeah, I mean, they're usually part of those same information sessions, so. Right, a and also part of our not-for-profit task force that we referenced. Okay, so um, with regard to the task force, the council appreciates that the commission, that commission at GF recognized the need for a collaborative dialogue with not-for-profit partners and created the task force. What specifically led the commissioner to convene uh, the task force? I think it was out, um, inquiries and concerns being expressed by the council and its staff and by um, advocates and representatives of the not-for-profit community. How often has uh, the task force, task force met and um, are there any additional meetings planned for the, for the future? So the, the task force has been meeting approximately three times a year and we're planning to continue it indefinitely.
Um, what were DOF's biggest takeaways from the task force? Um, well, one was to include language on our um, approvals that about the application process for DEP. Um, we thought that that was, was critical. Um, I, I, I th frankly, the, the big, having a forum like that is really in, invaluable to us. Um, we are trying as best we can to reach out to all of the not-for-profits. There is 13,000 of them. Um, there are times when we, we don't reach every one. Um, there are, as you know, we have um, coordination issues with ourselves and other city agencies. And the more um, quickly we get feedback from our customers and the not-for-profits are our customers, um, the faster issues can be resolved. So that, to us, is more important than any one particular issue. Just having that feedback built into the system is extremely important to us. Are your forms or um, brochures available in other languages? Uh, the, the brochure that I referenced in my testimony as it has not yet been distributed. Um, so a, as of now, we only have uh, a version in English. Um, frankly, we wanted to um, converse with the council and, and um, get your input, both in terms of content, distribution, and publicity before we formally issue it. Good, and I, because um, there is a term on that literature um, that I didn't know what it meant, actually. A certificate of ordination. What is that? For um, what's called a parsonage exemption, which is con uh, covered under real property tax law for section 462, um, which governs property which is owned by a not-for-profit corporation, um, but is used as a living quarters for the officiating clergy. We need to have the certificate of ordination to, uh, you know, affirm that this is actually the officiating clergy. The residents. So uh, religious organizations would know what that is? They, they do, and we work with we, we work with most people about what's required, and, and those we, we will get in different languages, and we will have translated as well. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to stop here, and then I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Councilmember Cabrera. Oh, also, we've been joined by Councilmembers uh, Moya and Jonai. Thank you so much, and because it is her first bill, I'm going to let uh, Councilmember Farrell Lewis ask the questions first. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, intro 1784 would establish the Office of Nonprofit Services. It would serve as a liaison for nonprofit organizations in relation to city policies, procedures, regulations, and benefits affecting um, the nonprofit sector. Where do you envision this office being housed and why? So I think that the current structure of the NRC has been quite effective um, and produced uh, results as um, are listed in the back of the testimony in our resource section and online, and welcome the opportunity to discuss that with council, uh, what it might look like going forward in order to ensure that we maintain this body of work. And many nonprofit organizations contract with the city, especially for service delivery purposes, um, which are critical services. How would this office effectively act as a clearinghouse for contracting issues that may arise? So um, one of our biggest areas of work is streamlining, streamlining administrative practices. Mm -hmm. And um, the way, I'll, I'll just step back for a minute to explain the way that issues get uh, addressed through the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee is providers come to the committee with their challenges, their concerns. Oftentimes they're quite wide um, and broad and then we take those concerns and collectively identify how we might be able to tack tackle them in an actionable way uh, to come up with reforms, new practices, eliminate some practices to make it easier to do business. Mm -hmm. um, so if there are contracting challenges or any other types of ad administrative uh, concerns, we'll take them and unravel them together and put it back together in a way that makes sense. Hopefully it would be effective, um, better than what it is now. Um, 
Several informal organizations exist across the city that have been unable to take the necessary steps to incorporate, whether due to resources, lack of information, and language barriers. Do you have an estimate on how many of those organizations currently exist? I'm sorry, I'm just having a little bit of trouble uh, he hearing, that, hearing you. Would you mind just repeating that ag again? Maybe it's the microphone. Of course. Do you have an, an estimate of how many organizations exist that tried to incorporate but could not? I don't, I don't have that information. You don't have, can you provide it at a later date? Of ones that tried to incorporate? Mm -hmm. We don't have that information. I know um, one of the uh, uh, areas that we're focused on um, in the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee is um, obtaining greater equity and access for small community-based organizations. It's a work group that's active right now, mm -hmm. and we're focused on trying to understand uh, who out there is looking to do business with the city, mm -hmm. um, and how can we make it easier to do that. Um, also, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services um, is uh, getting ready to release um, another uh, uh, module for Passport, the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal, and that um, uh, technology platform is designed to make contracting with the city easier, more accessible, more transparent, clear, um, so there's a number of initiatives out there that are working on that exact uh, topic. Okay, look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I first want to thank you for all the work uh, that you have done. I've been working and led a nonprofit, gee, now 32 years, and I've seen a vast difference when I first started to what we see nowadays in terms of accessibility to information, resources, where to find, who knows who to do what, which is uh, the beginning was like a maze, I had to tell you. Um, and this is why this next question, I, I wanted more of, uh, more details in terms of where would the office uh, for the non for profits office will be? Will it be in Mox? Would it be w where exactly would it be? And also, how uh, would it be different uh, than the NRC? So, the way the legislation is written, it gives us a lot of options to discuss, and I think we should. Um, along with our partners um, in the NRC effort and try to identify the variety of ways that the NRC and its work can continue into the future. Um, there's a, you know, a number of different iterations. It's working very well in its current format, so figuring out how do we ensure that that continues. Um, you know, certainly we're all committed through the administration, but I think we're here to talk about making sure it goes on. So, so him, I'm trying to envision what it would look like. Would you get in, would you, where would the staff come from? There will, there will be, are there staff that you have right now that you're using, those are the staff you're gonna use? Or I know you're working with all the agencies. How, I'm trying to envision, I, I, let's say I call in from a nonprofit. I wanna meet with somebody. Who am I meeting with? Uh, how many people will be in that office? Do, have you structurized and strategized what that would look like, or is this a work in process? So I can describe to you what it looks like now. Okay. Um, and it, again, um, it, it feels like it's, it's uh, creating um, tangible results and meaningful results. Uh -huh. um, so we do have teams of individuals that are working on NRC initiatives. We partner with NYC Opportunity. We are working with City Hall uh, inside of Mox. We have how many are the we? Pardon me. How many how many people involved in the we and the NRC? How many how many are of you? So it's across the city. Okay. It's, it's DYCD. It's DIFTA. It's DOHMH. <laughs> it's um, Mayor's Office of Opportunity, um, Operations is involved, they're helping to co-chair gotcha. a work stream. DOP is involved, so, so this, the number of folks that are involved with NRC initiatives is quite vast on the city side, as well as on the nonprofit side. We don't uh, just have nonprofit organizations, but we have about a dozen coalition and membership groups that are there to represent all of the nonprofits that can't be in the room. 
Um, it's a distributed model that allows for a lot of voices and perspectives and it allows for the right people to be in the room when we're having you know, the particular conversations that we're having. Um, and so uh, if, if an individual, uh, if an organization uh, calls, and I think that was the second part of your question, with a question or with a concern, sometimes that's something that we um, engage the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee around. Like we bring it into one of our work group meetings. We invite the organization to participate in the conversation. Sometimes it's just making the right connection with the right agency um, and, and enabling that conversation to happen. Um, but it's, it's across the whole city and it's encompassing all the, the agencies and, and here at City Hall. Maybe, maybe what I'm trying to figure out is when somebody calls in, right, uh, and let's say we have the office, uh, would there be three staffers, four staffers that would be responsible all day long to make sure that, that all the connection and connecting the dots are taking place? Is that what I'm looking at here or? I think that's the exciting part of the conversation, right? Okay. What's it gonna look like? Great. Right, like this is what we've got now, do we wanna change it? What's it gonna look like? Okay, I'm thinking in terms of our fiscal responsibility, in terms of the office, what would it cost? Uh, if we keep it the way it is, how do we make it better? I'm sure we're always looking at how to, how to make it better. And so, let me, um, I, I meant to ask uh, regarding the, the uh, Department of Finance process for tax exempt. Is, is there a particular reason why is January uh, the applications go in? Are, are we looking at, a, we're not looking at a fiscal year here, right? Yeah. Um, so I think Jan w January 5th is the taxable status date. Right. Um, via the administrative code. Is, but, is uh, the so what, I'm sorry? A taxable status date. Okay. So, the so what does that mean for, for the? Uh, so learning? I'm going to let my my colleague who has okay. more detailed knowledge. And just um, for the record, this is uh, Jean Carubia. Um, she also, um, Mr. Oberman had to leave for an appointment. Um, she also works with Mr. Oberman in DOF's property exemption administration office that handles um, NFP and other exemptions. Okay, so we have to swear her in. Yeah. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so the taxable status date is January 5th. That's the legal date by which the Department of Finance has to have the assessed values on for the coming tax year. Mm -hmm. And so in the administrative code, that is the date uh, by which we require the not-for-profit renewal forms to be submitted. However, as you heard Ted Oberman say, we do give a courtesy extension, which allows those not-for-profits who haven't been able to file to submit. So the, the, the logical question that, I'm, uh, that will follow, so let's say I, a nonprofit, right, uh, house of worship, purchase a building in August, uh, would, would that be retroactive? They, they make the application or they have to wait until the following January and do they have to pay the taxes for that period of time? Well, here's what happens generally. If they purchase the property, let's say August of this year, and they submit an application shortly thereafter, and I'll call it an application that is clean, we have all the identifying documents that we need, we can put the exemption on retroactive to their purchase date, and they will not have to file a renewal for this renewal period because we've just granted their exemption. They would have to file a renewal for the following tax year. Is there a situation with, is there a month where that wouldn't happen, let's say November? I'm just trying to think, if there is a disadvantage if you apply any time during the year? There is no disadvantage. Okay. We renew, we accept applications on a year-round basis. We issue and grant exemptions on a year-round basis. And the way we create our um, pool of properties for <coughs> renewal is to not send out a renewal to um, properties that have just received an exemption July or later in that year. 
This is a change of policy from many, many years ago, right? I think years ago, uh, if you didn't apply by a certain time, you kind of were stuck with the tax bill. I'm talking about many years ago, like 15, 20. Oh, I can't respond yeah. to that that many years yeah, ago? Yeah, it was, and I see some hint noddings. I, and I remember, uh, it was a very scary time, to be honest with you, every time. Because, you know, you could purchase a building and you could easily pay $70,000, uh, and, and that could literally bring a nonprofit down just the first year when you have so many startups. Uh, when you just get in barely started, you purchase a building, you always have um, unexpected uh, bills, uh, things that you didn't budget for. So I, I'm really doing right now is commending you all for uh, the change, whoever changed it, whenever they changed it. Right, so, so our goal is not to penalize not-for-profits. And so even with the, the deadlines that my colleagues have explained, during the um, tax lien sale process, if uh, not-for-profits come forward, at that time, we will um, grant the exemption as well, because our goal is not to sell the tax lien, our goal is not to give a bill, our goal is to get the information that's needed so we can grant the exemption. That, that is our priority. It is not to issue penalties of any type. And what's the policy, if you have a nonprofit and you wanna rent to another a nonprofit, let's say during the day, what's the current policy for that? It is possible for a not-for-profit to rent to another not-for-profit, but we will ask for documentation, the same documentation that we asked for from the owning not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. And if that entity itself qualifies in its own right, as if they own the property, um, we will or we can grant them an exemption, provided that the rent that is collected by the owner does not exceed their costs to maintain the property. Just the rent, what about when it comes to, you know, electrical bill, heating bills, is that included in there as well? For the financials, okay. the maintenance, depreciation, and carrying costs, and we'll make an analysis of what it costs to run the property and versus what the owner is collecting. But they cannot, just to be clear, they cannot do that for for-profit organizations. So, so it's example, a daycare or, if you have a senior center that's for profit, they're using it for nine to five, do they lose their nonprofit status for that space? It depends is what I'm going to say. I mean, the, the entity that's renting has to be a not-for-profit organization. It, it can't okay. be a for-profit senior center or a for-profit school, and I'm just sort of trying, right. I think I'm getting at what you're saying. Right. right. Yeah. Well, in some situations, uh, as I alluded to er earlier, it, depending on the arrangement, they may lose the not-for-profit exemption on a portion of the property, okay. right? It, so if some portion is being rented out at commercial rates and they're receiving uh, a profit, then it may be, oh, the fourth floor, that no longer is eligible, but the bottom three floors, because that's still being used for, say, religious purposes, that is getting um, the NFP exemption. So in that situation, we may be granting a 75% um, exemption as opposed to 100%. So the, the particulars really matter Indeed. in terms of determining um, not only whether, but what the percentage of the um, NFP exemption should be. And how difficult it is once that lease is over, let's say there's an arrangement and it's only for a year, how difficult it is to get reinstated to have the nonprofit piece? Well, on our uh, annual renewal, the tax, uh, we ask free. the Sorry, owner, ahead. has the use of the property changed? So if that organization is receiving a 75% exemption, and they report to us no more, no more tenant, we now use the entire property uh, for our purposes. We may have an inspection of the property, but we're likely to grant it a full exemption as of the date that the tenant vacated. That's very, very helpful. And last question, uh, uh, regarding getting back uh, to the office uh, for nonprofit, do you foresee, this is a place that people could actually walk in uh, and receive services? Is this be all, only over the phone? 
Uh, are we talking about a website? Uh, how are people gonna get their resources? How are our nonprofits are gonna learn about uh, the fact that this office actually exists? That's what we would talk about, right? Uh, it sounds like you have a list of starting questions that we would talk about with our partners and um, you know understand what uh, we're doing today and uh, if if there you know is opportunity or interest in doing things different uh, in the future. Okay, so we st we're starting block. One second. And last question: What other resources would this office require in order to effectively? Uh, be able to connect with city agency as prescribed in intro 1784. Again, uh, we're effectively connecting providers with agencies now, uh, so that would be part of the conversation if there are other areas uh, you know, that we wanted to reach into, um, and that's all part of what this might look like in the future. I think um, the key takeaway is that the work of the NRC has been effective and really wanted to express our appreciation in recognizing that work and the shared interest in ensuring that it continues going on into the future. Okay. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I Thank you. turn it back uh, to the chair. Follow up. Um, how often does the NRC meet? Uh, I want to say weekly. We meet in various work groups, um, hundreds of meetings every single year, um, meetings this week, next week, last week. Um, it's a constant engagement. Okay, so how, uh, what is the process on how the NRC's policy initiatives are effectuated? So the working groups uh, identify uh, how they're going to cr take a, a broad challenge, a conceptual issue, and break it down into a tangible project with uh, measurable goals uh, for implementation, uh, create a policy document around um, implementation, bring it to the full committee for uh, review and approval if it's approved by the full committee um, of nonprofit uh, organizations in the NRC, we then move to implementation. Because the policies and practices are co-designed with city agencies and nonprofits, they, what, by the time they come to um, approval uh, status, They've taken into account the considerations on the ground for both parties, and they make a lot of sense for implementation. And so we, we work together to try to understand why agencies are, are engaged in uh, activities the way that they are, what that feels like on the ground for nonprofits, um, sharing ways that we might improve or change, and then collectively coming together to write what that looks like. What would be some of the challenges that the um, nonprofits continue to face? I think, um, you know, there's a lot, I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done, right? We've accomplished a lot, but by no means is this a uh, representation of like work is done, uh, everything is, uh, you know, peachy cane, scrumptious, you know, whatever uh, adjective you want to use. Um, some of the key priorities that we hear from nonprofits right now is, you know, we did a, uh, a very effective job of registering contracts on time for July 1st start dates. Let's, let's do that again for FY21, and you know, we're putting it on ourselves to even do better than what we uh, accomplished last year in our pilot year. Uh, Passport is a big initiative for the sector. Um, it's a citywide system that's going to impact the way that we do business with vendors across all sectors, but for nonprofits, it's gonna provide that transparency that they don't have. It's gonna provide that roadmap uh, to registration that they currently don't have readily accessible to them. Uh, it facilitates conversations inside of a system um, in real time. So uh, that's another key priority for the sector. Um, and then they continue to come to us with additional ones. Um, as I mentioned before, we're working on uh, creating greater access and equity for those small nonprofits, understanding who they are um, and how we can bring them into contracting um, if that's what they're interested in doing and growing their businesses. Um, also trying to understand how we might uh, incorporate uh, issues around uh, justice-involved communities into our programs and services. Um, Commissioner Scheer, uh, in terms of um, organizations that might rent from a church on an hourly basis, is that factored into the uh, equation of whether the property is being used to raise money, or is there, is there a, uh, what, I guess, a threshold you have to go over, or is that not looked at, or how do, how do you deal with that? 
Uh, uh, well, I think that the general threshold is whether the owning pro uh, um, organization is making a profit off of the lease, but I'm going to let Ms. Carubia ex expound on that. I would assume in most cases they're probably losing money. Um, I'm not aware of any organization that rents from a not-for-profit on an hourly basis. Who are like a church or, a, um, you know, they rent it out to a community-based organization. Often when we've seen houses of worship say that they have something like, um, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous mm -hmm. there or some other group, if the money is what is known as de minimis, we're not going to reduce their exemption. Okay, that's, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, we have a question now from Councilmember Joe Knight, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, Department of Finance created non for profit task force which aimed to connect non for profit property owners with local government resources, addressing issues related to the property tax exemptions, ta lien sales, water and sewer, DEP, DOB exemptions, and the FDNY imposed charges. If a task force has already been created in 2018 and has reasonable success, why should a formal office be created? Right, so I, I think that question is both for me and for Ms. Geiling. So the, um, the office relates to intro 1784 which I think relates to the, the contracting um, issues that have been discussed today. The task force that the Department of Finance has set up with our sister agencies relates primarily to um, tax and water and sewer charges and, uh, and delinquencies resulting from that. So it's really two separate efforts. I don't know if, um, if Jennifer wants to add to that. Yeah, just uh, two additional points. So, um, so first, um, the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, um, a lot of the work that we do translates into reforms in the contracting process, but it is not established as an office or um, a center for contracting reforms. Um, it's a center for centralized conversations with the city and uh, nonprofits in order to take sector-wide action, which as I mentioned before, it does translate many times into contract-based actions, but it's, it's across the board. Um, programmatic um, as well as, you know, th the contract is the basis of the relationship between the city and the, the nonprofit. And then the second thing, if I may, is um, the NRC is designed to collaborate across all city agencies um, and our initiatives flow through to all city agencies. And so we collaborate with uh, DOF. We're continuing our conversations, how we can support one another um, in the work that we're pursuing on behalf of nonprofits. Thank you, but I want to stay focused a bit on the task force. Is that okay? Yep. So it, it, yes, the, it's okay. The report um, does not include statistical evidence that the task force is not sufficient to meet the needs instead of creating this office. Am I correct? I'm sorry. I'm not sure which report you're alluding My to. My understanding there was a uh, report that was issued based on the findings of the task force and it didn't indicate that the task force wasn't sufficient and that required an office dedicated, that there is no evidence that we would need a specific office versus a continued task force that will address and assess the needs and intergovernmental um, agencies working with non-for-profits. So the, the not-for-profit task force um, that is hosted by DOF has not issued a, a report. So, so I'm just, uh, I'm. I thought there was, in 2018, there was a requirement that a report be issued by the task force on its findings. Uh, Am I wrong here? I, I, I'm not aware of that. We, we established the task force in 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of us having issued a report. The one thing that I did testify to was that we drafted a brochure relating to um, tax lien sale um, and exemptions, but I'm not aware of our having issued a formal report. And maybe, Chairman, maybe that's what we should be looking for, asking for a report from the task force on its findings as we determine uh, the future of, the future needs of our uh, not-for-profits. Um, 
I could thank you for that. I think maybe there was a misunderstanding between the guide that you proposed and the report, and there was no mention in the report of a need for an officer, that the task force wasn't sufficient to meet the needs and assessments of non-for-profits. You know, we're, I, I'm happy to sit down with, with you and, and your staff to, so that we can get to the bottom of the, the misunderstanding. Thank you. So policy proposals at all levels of government threaten work of all non-for-profits. Um, policymakers, including this administration, your departments and various agencies, whether intentionally or un unintentionally, um, take away the needed resources imposed unnecessarily, unnecessary burdens and interfere with the decision making, um, creating harmful barriers and changes and changes in laws in ways that disrupt the work of these charitable non-for-profits. Arguably, and I heard you say that we're not looking to penalize, we're not looking to punish our non-for-profits, but arguably, shouldn't the same arguments be made for small businesses in New York City? Shouldn't we actually be striving not to penalize, not to harm or punish, but actually work with non-for-profits and for-profit entities so they can continue to thrive? In general, I, I would say yes. My, my colleagues at the Department of Small Business Services aren't here today, so I think they, they would be um, best placed to respond to those concerns. But I would imagine that would be a mission for this administration and all of our agencies and departments to say for the balance and future of New York City, we should be looking at this in a holistic view where all entities, whether they are non-for-profit or for-profit. I, I believe that's the mission of the Department of Small Business Services. So then is it fair as small business chair I would imagine it would be appropriate, appropriate for me to ask that question for my struggling small businesses, the micro businesses, the mom and pops. Why should non-for-profits be exempt or treated any differently from small businesses when it comes to communications, when it comes to striving to improve the environment or any legislation or policy that undermines their very existence? Uh, we believe in clear communication to um, sp um, small and large businesses. We believe that's very important in, in, in our role at the Department of Finance. Would you be surprised at the way that many of our small businesses or big businesses find out about legislation and policy is when they're in violation? I, I think that we are willing to have a conversation with you about the issues that they're having. New York City currently has 6,000 rules and regulations which for-profit and non-for-profit must comply with. There is no easy to read, no transparent or easy to follow in any other language, which is also a need, for our businesses or non-for-profits to be able to understand the rules and regulations that they're supposed to adhere with. And the only way they find out is when someone issues normally in the form of a pink little piece of paper that says, you're in violation, please pay. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for the for-profit or the non-for-profit. And it's just not the communications. It's 6,000 rules and regulations Attorneys have a hard time understanding these rules and regulations and the compliance. How could non-for-profits, the same agencies that are now working to meet the needs of these non-for-profits and assist them, are the same agencies that don't understand their rules and regulations and their various interpretations from inspector to inspector? So I commend you on striving for better communications. But within a city that overregulates, and whether intentionally or unintentionally, 
punishes and penalizes everyone across the board is undermining the very existence of those that we really want to help and that are doing God's work, and that is our non-for-profits, and we can't take the for-profit um, part of the, out of the equation. Thank you. I, I just like to say that I think um, one difference here is that the small businesses do have the small business services, um, but the nonprofits don't have that resource available. So I think that Council Member Lewis's um, legislation is trying to address that concern. Thank you, Chairman, but uh, SBS tries to do uh, and address the needs of small businesses, but they, them too, are baffled. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the infractions, it's the policies, it's the legislation, it's the form of taxation uh, that undermines their very existence. So if SBS can't do it, mm. I assure you, whatever office we come up with, with a non-for-profit, will have the same hurdles and obstacles and challenges ahead of themselves. And rather than have two separate offices, one for small businesses and one for non-for-profits, because the mission is the same, we can have one office mm -hmm. as the resource. Okay, thank you. All right, now I want to say we have been joined by Council Members Rosenthal and Rodriguez, and Council Member Rosenthal has questions. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to see the team. I'm so pleased to hear that you're heading up the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee. It really makes a lot of sense. That's great, and you've done amazing work over the last few years. Um, I just I want to check a couple of things just to get a pulse. Um, 80% uh, talking first about timely registration. Um, what's the statistics? So it was J July 1st, 2019, 80% were registered? We're, we're ready for registration on ready. time. Yep, so ready? at the comptroller on July 1st. It, it went to the controller's office by July 1st, got it. And if you compare that, seriously, stay with me to five years ago, what would that number have been? I don't have that data in front of me, but happy to circle back. Yeah, just sort of trying to get a sense of two other points, mm -hmm. uh, data points. Maybe 10 years ago, um, around 2010 maybe, um, and then, you know, three years ago. If that's possible, I would love to just sort of see where we were at those three time periods. Yeah, happy to circle back with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the 25% advance, which is just terrific, um, is that upon registration or upon sending it to the controller's office? Upon registration. Thank you. Um, I and it's available, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but it's also, if you have a multi-year contract, yeah. right, so if you have a contract for six years, it's available at the start of each fiscal yep. year. Yep, thank you, got mm -hmm. it. Um, and that's not a, is that a change? Or? That's a change. It's a change? Yeah, that happened through the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee. It went uh, into effect, I think this is the third fiscal year. Uh, but it went into effect. We had a work group of nonprofit providers, um, and they brought, uh, so this is a perfect example of where the nonprofit providers came into the room and said, we're having issues with cash flow. Okay, so what does that mean, and how do we make change? And the provider said one area that would be very helpful with cash flow is to have a consistent standard policy for advances. Yep. So, okay, what does that look like? What are you experiencing on the ground? I'm, this is what I have with agency A, this is what I have with agency B. Program C doesn't even have advances at all. This is what's happening in other municipalities. Like our research even goes beyond the city of New York. Mm -hmm. um, and providers designed this policy um, and the administration uh, accepted the recommendation and adopted it. What's really um, amazing about FY20, why, why the slides say it's a breakthrough, is that while the advances have been around for a few years, they were certainly maximized with timely registration. Because as you mentioned, they come into play when the contracts are registered. So 
if they're registered on time, you're getting those advances at the start of the fiscal year. Right. So, um, uh, so this is only for like a three-year contract, right? No. Where the advances? Yeah. No. Oh, sorry, a re recurring multiple-year contract? Yes. Every year you're entitled to at least a 25% advance. If um, one of the nonprofits uh, has a contract with the Department of Aging to run senior centers for three years and then it gets renewed three years later and renewed three years later, does their contract have to be registered every year? No, they, it's registered in that first year. Yep. And then in the second year, they have a budget that's approved and they get their second advance for that year. Yes, that's right. And then the at. third one, yeah, they have another 25% advance on their annual that's budget. That's right. And then the following year? Same thing. They, you know, go, whatever the renewal process is, once Got it's it. registered, 25% advance, 25% advance, 25% advance. That's great. Um, what's the timing we just negotiated the indirect rate I know this is not exactly on topic but uh, we just negotiated the indirect rate. do you uh, have a sense of whether or not any additional funds will be in the November modification or the preliminary plan I don't have that information okay and then just checking on passport um, you've implemented phases one and two is that correct correct there are two more phases to go? We have a, in the spring, we have another release coming, yes, and then following that, uh, we're anticipating another release. Say that, just say that one more time. So spring is uh, phase three, mm -hmm. and then? We're anticipating another release after uh, the spring release. I don't have the dates or anything. Oh, okay, me. and just one more, or do you think that's it? After oh, three, um, I don't have you know all the information, but happy to brief you on where we are and where we're headed and what we're looking forward to at any time. Great. And um, once it's fully implemented, do you think that'll obviate the need for accelerator? Will accelerator just be subsumed? Yeah, I don't have information on you know sort of going out that far, but happy to have conversations with you about. Only curious, I mean, currently do nonprofits have to register on both Passport and Accelerator? It depends on the scenarios and uh, happy to meet with you with our team that's, okay. you know, um, more intimately involved with Passport. Thanks and congratulations again. I know this was a really big effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Chair Cabrera. A quick question, uh, just so I could uh, wrap up regarding um, uh, intro 1784. Uh, is there any edits that you see that we need to do on the bill, and is it broad enough? So I think that there's a room for conversation. So I think we should, you know, have the conversations about what uh, NRC or an uh, NRC might look like the work that we're doing into the future. So but in regards to the bill, you know, because if it's broad enough, then you could have once the bill is passed, you could have that level of conversation. It's, it's, but in terms of the bill, is there anything there that concerns you? Anything that you see that uh, we need to edit? Is it broad enough to make sure that we cover all the bases? Yes, yeah, so um, again, looking forward to having the conversations with our partners, with council. Um. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, and I only have a couple more as well. Um, proposed intro 245A would require DOF to designate an individual to serve as the ombudsperson for the not-for-profit property owners and respond to inquiries related to property tax exemptions denial, termination, or revocations of benefits and tax lien sales. How does DOF currently field questions from not-for-profit sector, from the not-for-profit sector regarding property tax exemptions and lien sales? Um, so we currently have a, a number of offices that receive inquiries. So um, our, the collections division which runs the tax lien sale process may receive inquiries. 
um, if people come to us, organizations, and identify themselves as um, not-for-profits, um, and if they submit materials, they'll be referred to the um, Property Exemptions Administration Unit, um, which, which is represented here today. We also have people who will um, show up. We do many events that are co-sponsored by council members trying to get the word out. So we have NFPs going to those events. Our Office of External Affairs, which works with council members that sets those up, um, will be getting those. And as I mentioned in my testimony, we also now have an Office of the Taxpayer Advocate. So um, someone who is not satisfied with the um, contact they have had with, with DOF uh, might go directly to that office as well. And what about if somebody walks into one of your business centers? How would that be handled there? Uh, so uh, typically, if it's usually when it's a not-for-profit organization that's um, coming to us, it's usually about trying to get an exemption. So um, our business centers are trained to um, e either refer the individual directly to um, the, the PEA unit if they need to, or the forward uh, if they come in with an application or supporting documentation to, to forward that to the, to the PEA unit. Okay. Like and can you describe the role and responsibilities? May I just add something about sure. that? We field many questions via our website and uh, our customer service units, especially the payment centers, they will take customer inquiries and call us up while someone is right at the desk. When we can answer questions, we will. And when they get our applications for new exemptions, they forward them on to us. So we have a very good relationship with our external units or our, customer, our business centers. They pretty much know what to do. But 311, our web mailbox gets lots of traffic and we respond to that. Okay. And can you uh, describe the role and responsibilities of the ombuds person, persons currently at DOF, including Scree and Dree ombud persons? While I work with commercial exemptions, I know that the uh, Scree and Dree um, ombudsman on the personal side of the house tries to make inroads with organizations, especially for Scree and Dree, to put the word out there that the, there are these benefits that many renters probably or may be unaware of. So they do community um, outreach, they go to senior centers and uh, places like that and provide assistance with even completing the application. And, and I would, the other positions I'm aware of in DOF, um, as I mentioned, we have the Office of the Taxpayer Advocate. Um, we have a newly created office, um, Parking Summons Advocate. Uh, and we do have a tax lien sale ombudsperson um, who's appointed within the Collections Division, um, again, to sort of be the um, place to come to for people who feel like they're falling between the cracks. Okay. okay. Uh, and finally, let me just say, um, ask which, which city agency or office is responsible for updating the content on New York City nonprofit? Uh, um, sorry. Uh, historically, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services has uh, managed the NYC uh, DACA of uh, nonprofits website, um, and we have input in partnership with our city agencies. Okay, from what I understand, the New York City nonprofit doesn't currently have any information on property tax exemption or exemption for water and sewer charges. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not familiar with that specifically, but happy you know, to post uh, additional information. Uh, we work with our uh, city agency partners. We don't um, own the NYC nonprofit's webpage, but we you know, keep it uh, updated and we take information uh, from our agency partners and um, enable it to be part of the website. Okay, I'm sure we'd like to work with you further on that. Um, and is this website intended to be a comprehensive resource for nonprofits who would like to engage with the city? It's 
So the website is designed to provide resources for both uh, providers that currently do business with the city and for those who are interested in doing business with the city. So we provide information and we've tried to identify um, sort of which road uh, you might go down uh, through the tabs along the top. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're going to end here with uh, the administration and we're going to call up our advocates now. Uh, thank you for coming in for giving testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you as well. So Andrew Wedegun, Andrew So we have three panels, and we're going to limit our speakers to about three minutes each. First up will be Paula Siegel, Take Root Justice, uh, Yasir Salim from Al Muni uh, found the Al Munir Foundation, um, Mara Kravitz, uh, Protect Our Places Coalition, and. Marcia Eisenberg from the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York. Chairpersons, good afternoon. Um, before my time actually starts, um, I just want to point out that I am a member of the not-for-profit task force, which was created in direct response to requests. What's, what's your name? I'm sorry, Paula Siegel, Take Root Justice. Um, the not-for-profit task force is something that the agency has voluntarily created and voluntarily convenes whenever it feels like. The last meeting was in January of 2019. It is now mid-November 2019. I have not been invited to another meeting, though I agree that the conversations that happen in that room are useful because they tip the agency off to things like, you should send your notices in a colored envelope instead of a white one. We're really glad to give them good ideas. That does not change the big picture, which is that when the risk for organizations for mistakes that the agency or organization administrators make or deaths in our communities is immense. The risk, if you don't open that white envelope, is that a lien will be put on your property and sold to a Wall Street investor who can foreclose on the church and sell it to anybody with a clean deed. I don't care if it's 1% of properties. This year, the department sold liens like that on 50 properties that it itself has granted exemptions for in the past five years where there has been no change in the owner. So I don't know, that, it's the, that risk is just too great. That's 50 properties too many. You heard, I, I wrote something very nice oh, just, right just to, here, just and you have it in front of you about Deputy Commissioner Scheer. I'm so angry because I feel like we just spent an hour talking about something that doesn't exist. The not-for-profit task force is not a thing that exists in law or practice. It's a nice thing, but it's not a thing that we can rely on, and we just went on an hour-long detour pretending that that was something that actually happens. I wouldn't call it an hour-long detour. Okay, but we have, we have I'm sorry, I'm, I see that I'm on the clock, so I'm gonna try to get my points in. And but right, okay, I'll stop the clock for a second. Thank you. All right, but we, <laughs> we do have to extract from the administration. That's our job as elected officials. But we're here also to hear what your concerns are as well. And I know that you have a number of concerns. Thank so you. we're gonna hear what you have to say also, and then we will be communicating again with you. I really appreciate that, thank you. I feel a little better. <laughs> um, so it was frustrating to hear Deputy Commissioner Scheer, who has been a really good partner in all of this, say things that are simply untrue under oath, one of which he said that the department is already taking properties out of the lien sale list that have had exemptions in the last two years. The list the department published of liens sold includes 16 such properties. That might be their plan for fiscal 20, but they didn't do it in 19. So he can't sit here and tell you that is what they're already doing, and there's no need for a bill to tell them to do that. Um, and it's just incredibly frustrating since I'm pulling information from their own website. I'm not even looking at organizations where the department has improperly denied an exemption, and you'll hear from one of my clients in a moment. 
Um, but the other thing that Commissioner Scheer suggested is that they were only willing to pull uh, organizations from the lean cell list if they had previously had an exemption, even if they were in the process of appealing a denial through the proper channels, whether it's through refiling an application to the department or through the tax commission. That's nonsensical, right? You, if, you are, if you've been denied and you're appealing, you've never had an exemption before. That's the point. So them saying they're only willing to pull organizations from the lean cell list if they've already had an exemption in the past, that makes no sense. There's also ways in which the passport system is being weaponized against organizations that own property. With the advent of passport, organizations that are service providers do better to lease property as opposed to own it because anytime they get into any kind of administrative morass with the Department of Finance, that shows up in Passport as though it's a credit rating system, and then the folks at Passport won't approve the contract registration unless the organization actually gives the Department of Finance money it doesn't owe. So if any of the, anybody who's on the steps with us before this hearing saw big checks that we blew up, because they're actually all refund checks of money that organizations have loaned to the administration, because that was their only way forward to either stay out of the lien sale or to, to pass the registration process with Passport. Um, I did write down some things. You have them. I got it right here. Yep. So I want to move those on. Are, to those are my immediate thoughts. Okay. All right. Thank you for sharing that. I hear what you said, we'll look into that further, and I know that you've been communicating with Sebastian in my office as well. Yeah. Oh, Thank okay, you. good. Yep. All right, next please. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Mohammed Salim, and I represent Al Munir Foundation, which is a non-for-profit religious organization in Queens. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all, of, all of you to give me the opportunity to express my first-hand ordeal of going through the uh, very difficult process of exemption. Uh, so uh, we purchased a property worth about a million dollars in 2010, and we shortly after that applied for the exemption. Uh, our exemption was denied, uh, and you know we uh, applied it again with uh, trying to fill up the requirements they had given to us. It was uh, denied again, uh, and the third time again. And the third time we never got a response back. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to communicate. The 311 number doesn't give you enough information. If you go to the office, uh, you just are given uh, the application again to fill it out. Uh, there isn't an advisory over there who will help you go through the procedure. Uh, the other thing is that the time when we were applying, we still owed taxes, and those were huge amounts of money. We did not have that amount to uh, pay uh, because we are engaged in providing uh, religious, social, and uh, a lot of educational and charity uh, uh, services to our community. Uh, unfortunately, in 2015, we got a letter that our property has been foreclosed. It was a very dramatic uh, letter for all of us. We had no idea what to do because this a million dollar property, we were just going to lose it. Uh, and this came from the hardworking people of our community who made small donations so that we can establish this organization. You can just imagine losing a million dollars, how dramatic and how stressful it was uh, for all of our management. Uh, but fortunately, uh, no, uh, uh, we came across Ms. Uh, Paula Segan and she, she helped us out, and we presented the same documentation, nothing different. But this time, she was uh, behind us, and we were able to go through the procedure. Uh, and again, nothing different, the same documents. And uh, in that procedure, we lost about $26,000 paying towards legal fees, uh, hiring attorneys and whatnot. And still after that, we were not sure we, we would come out of the foreclosure. It is only when Ms. Uh, Paula came on, on board, she helped us out through this ordeal. Uh, we got the $32,000 which we had paid in taxes, but we never got the $26,000 of uh, legal charges which we had paid. So I believe that this bill is very important. We should take uh, cons into considera consideration, make the process easier for us. Uh, you know, we are out there to help the community, and we, uh, we request, request uh, our government to be more uh, cooperative with us. Okay, thank you very much. Next, please. Hello, better? Hi. I'm Mara Kravitz. I'm with the Protect Our Places Coalition. We're a group of dozens of nonprofits, community organizations that have been directly impacted by the tax lien sale um, or that are umbrella organizations for those groups that have been impacted by the sale. Um, I've been uh, supporting nonprofits that have been stuck in the sale since 2016, and over the years, I've been, I've worked with 
um, gardeners and community gardeners, people who run houses of worship, people who provide veteran resources, all sorts of different groups watching them as they've scrambled to pay off debt that they never should have owed to the Department of Finance um, as they became aware of, of um, paying off debt from, from private collectors that were reaching out to them and then as they've had to address the threat of foreclosure. So this is an issue that's been um, impacting groups on the ground for um, years. It can't keep going on. Um, it's been wonderful to watch um, you all t take action on it and to watch um, the ways the Department of Finance has been pressured by advocates to change the practices towards it. Um, but the need for it is really imperative. It's a no-brainer. Nonprofits do not should not be paying property taxes and um, that, and the way it's been handled is complicated and can be made much simpler and much easier. Um, so I'm glad we're here today to halt such an obviously wrong scheme. Um, and um, what seems less obvious, and one thing I wanted to bring up, is what happens when charity organizations no longer do have the capacity to steward the, their real properties, the, their places, um, in general, charity-owned assets. As you know, they reflect years of public investment through direct government funding, as well as through foundation support in which private donors are provided governmental tax benefits in exchange for the gifts that they make towards the common good. So it's really vital that these spaces, um, that, that we do everything we can as a, as a government to support these spaces so that they can stay in, in common use for the common good uh, beyond the individual use of one charity. So I, um, as, so, it's very important that, especially given the, the apparent scarcity of affordable community spaces in, in our unbridled market, free market conditions in New York City, this is an incredible opportunity for us to uh, make sure that the public investment into these spaces is continued. So moving forward, considering how the current legislation can, can make sure that um, the new ombudsperson will be created and that will be created has to work with um, how, uh, HPD and third party transfer or a similar program. So when charity organizations no longer have the capacity to steward property, uh, residents in the city as a whole can benefit from a, a transfer to another responsible charity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, please. Hi, um, my name is Marcia Eisenberg. Um, thanks very much. I, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad you're holding these hearings. Um, and I appreciate that the, the two committees are looking at this very seriously. Um, I've uh, been the general counsel at the Jewish Community Relations Council and also run a program there called Legal Assistance for Jewish Organizations, and I've been doing it for 33 years. Um, I'm also in the same task force, which hasn't met for a while. We don't know why. But it was quite fruitful when we were meeting, and it was good. Um, I have, over the decades, I've spent enormous amounts of time working with all kinds of nonprofits, religious organizations, schools, etc., in the Jewish community, and also there's the churches and the mosques that I've worked with also. They've all had the same problems dealing with the city. Um, and um, it works, you know, it's all the other fees and charges that you've heard about already. The other thing is the Department of Finance has also uh, spent an enormous amount of time uh, working with all the different organizations that have to deal with the application and renewal process. Um, there is an enormous amount of time and energy by both the applicant organizations and the city. And some of the messes just never can get fixed because of timing, et cetera. Um, we all kind of thought the tax lien sale, I'm, I'm, I'm a very old lawyer, and it used to be they took title to the properties if you didn't pay. And I was dealing with 200 Jewish properties in 1986 that didn't even know they had been, the prop, they didn't own their property anymore, that the city owned the property. That was the level of communication in 86. It's a lot better now, but tax lien sales go through pretty quickly, even though they give a lot of notice. Um, and what happens with the tax lien sales, or as other people have mentioned, if you owe money to the city and you have a contract with the city, you have a lot of problems. Um, I deal a lot with religious organizations which don't have contracts with the city because they can't because um, of church-state separation. 
and they have a lot of problems. The lean sales, or even the threat of lean sales, is a major disaster for any of these organizations because it impacts on their contracts, it impacts on their, their donors, their, their money that's coming in, their reputation, and just, it, just a ripple effect through the entire city. If any agency gets wind that they're having a tax lien sale, they're going in, it's just a real disaster. Um, the city has gotten better at communicating, I must admit, but there's still a lot of people who are, are missed and it's a lot of organizations who are missed. Um, I, whoop, I'm done. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say this new initiative I think has been a very good step and I really support it. The only thing I thought about was that I thought that the ombudsman would, or person, excuse me, um, really should have uh, more power. I felt that it, that that person or entity or it should be able to pull out properties from tax lien for appropriate reasons besides what's defined in what you decide in legislation. Um, and also, I thought maybe the city council would like to use its oversight power to require and monitor periodic reports from the Department of Finance and make sure that they're doing what they need to do. And I kind of thought the single application form was a great idea. Um, even though things are very different, most of the other ent agencies, they only give, exempt they only give um, the exemptions to a subset of what the Department of Finance is already saying should be eligible. I know there's the devil in the details, um, but it seems to me that the city agencies, many of them have the capabilities of groups being able to upload all the documents they need and have them archived instead of it disappearing out of, uh, out of each of these agencies and groups having to reapply and re-upload and resend in all their stuff all the time. And I think that's something analogous to the deeds that are held in the city that anyone has access to and you can see it and it doesn't disappear and the agencies can look at it, it would be a much better, more centralized way to really run this whole thing. It's a, a lot of time is wasted by the city agency, which is kind of silly for the city and, and a disaster for the nonprofits. Um, I thought the Small Business <laughs> Services Office might be a good place for having uh, an office, but I, I just don't know enough about it. That was what someone has suggested. Um, I think it should be a place that really cares. Um, I listen to Mox, I know about Mox, but again, since nonprofits can't do contracts, that's a much of their focus, and I don't know if they can do both things at the same time. Thank you very much. It's an important problem, and I really hope you can help. Thanks, thanks for your suggestions uh, as well. I read them uh, just before you were seated, uh, and uh, we'll take them into consideration, definitely. Um, with um, um, regard to the, uh, the meetings, the task force meetings, I'm disappointed to hear that they have not met since January 19. We will look further into that and, I and see what's going on with that. Uh, I felt that, that was, if that's the case, and I don't I have no reason to not believe you, I was somewhat dishonest, and maybe they said it was last year. But but they said quarterly, no, which is interesting. It was supposed to be quarterly, and the thing that I thought of was that they actually shifted the tax lien sale to August this year, plus they have a new database and a new thing they're doing in the website, so I just didn't know if they got overloaded and didn't have, I, I, that's the only thing I can come up with. Um, it doesn't, they do it when they feel like it, that is not good enough, mm -hmm. no. by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. It really, I was looking for it and I thought, what's, what's happening, why is it not meeting, because it was very useful. Okay. There was also something that came up earlier about a report that report is something that the Taxpayer Advocates Office is supposed to create. The Office of the Taxpayer Advocate is something that the council mandated the last time the lien sale was reauthorized. There is an annual report. When that, ofi that office focuses on individual pay payers, on mm -hmm. individual taxpayers, um, though their staff has been great and there's since we've been working with them, there's always one person in that office who understands the nonprofit situation and usually the calls get, do get routed to that person. There's been a change in staff um, and the new person, it's not, it's not clear to me how much they advocate and how much they see their role as providing information. 
I have been told by staff at that office that their role is to provide information. That is not good enough. But the authorizing legislation for the Taxpayer Advocates Office does not clarify that they're supposed to do something more than provide information. It doesn't clarify what their role is with regards to not-for-profits at all. Okay, Chair Cabrera. Uh, just a quick question. It took you, if I heard you right, three years? More than three years. Uh, we applied in 2011 and uh, Ms. Twala got on board on 2016. So that's when we got it. Wow, and? I believe in 27. So were you able to get uh, every, everything you, you, I'm sure every year they, they force you basically to pay taxes? Yeah, we used to get bills every, every quarterly. So did you get your money back? Uh, we got the taxes which we paid, but we didn't get the legal charges which we paid to halt the foreclosure. Oh, we yeah. had hired attorneys and we hired uh, other people to help us out. So uh, the attorney, I believe itself was $17,000. So they still owe you 70000 Sorry? How much they still owe you, the city? No, the taxes, they have returned us back. Oh, okay. But the legal charges which we paid uh, to help us halt the foreclosure, those are just down the drain. Yeah, just the hardship. Sure. Look, I'm a pastor of a church. Okay. I know what houses of worship go through. It is, you're working with volunteers. Exactly. Uh, you, it's not like you get a contract from the city, you guarantee money, you know, coming in, whenever it comes in. Uh, it's, it's a lot of guessing work you're making when it comes to your budget. To put that added burden on you, really shame on the city that it took that long. And then the, the, the big question that I have is why did it took an outside entity and thank you for helping out. It, it just raised a lot of red flags uh, to me why it took so long and then it took somebody to basically do the same thing. Not basically, literally do the same thing. And those are the things that really tick me off uh, when it comes to treating one group of people different than others. Right, uh, and the most upsetting thing was we didn't submit anything new. The same documentations which we yeah, had that's been a, submitting. Shocking. Through. Uh, all, all the way through. Baffles me. Yeah. That's, that's really baffling. It's actually not uncommon for the Department of Finance not-for-profit unit to take an extremely paternalistic view to these applications and use them as an opportunity to enforce all kinds of laws that aren't theirs to enforce. So in this case, uh, they were concerned that the community center was being run out of a building with a certificate of occupancy for a doctor's office and they refused to grant the exemption uh, because of that. And you submitted exactly the same thing, plus a two-line letter from me that said, that is not your law to enforce, that's nice. And that was the only difference between the, you know, the first and second application and the third one, which was exactly the same, wow. plus a little note. Shocking. I, I just remember one thing uh, important is that uh, in 2017, we got another tax bill after all of this. <laughs> And we called the office and they said, no, never mind, just ignore it, uh, you know, don't worry about it, your next bill will show a zero. And that's what happened. And wow. actually, in fact, uh, two weeks ago was the first time uh, we got a letter in the mail asking us to renew our exemption. And that was the first time I went online and did it. Uh, it was not an easy thing to do. Uh, it should have been an easy thing. Uh, I'm an IT consultant. So, I mean, going on the computer and filling up a form shouldn't have been difficult, but it was no. uh, not an easy thing to do. No, thank you for sharing. I'll give it back to the chair. Okay, very good. Thank you all for coming in. We're going to ask them. Yes, quickly. I was going to say, what they did run, oh, no, I know. What he ran into was the, uh, in 2013, the Department of Finance started requiring that you had to have a CFO that, com you know, was th that you were doing in your building what the CFO allowed. And um, I called up and said, this is going to be a disaster in Brooklyn and Queens. Hmm. Um, because... I, no one's at home in Brooklyn in the Department of Buildings. I don't know if it's gotten any better because I haven't had to do an application. And they said, oh, well, you know, and this, was, this is a little story. They said, oh, here are the people you need to contact in the Department of Buildings. They gave me names and numbers. I spent a month leaving my number, leaving my name to about four different people in the Brooklyn Department of Buildings. No one ever called me back. I called and called and went back and said, there is no one there. I don't know where they are, 
but I can't get, I can't get a, a, they have like a letter that says they, they won't object, object to what you're doing. I can't find anyone to talk to. I've left extensive messages. Um, and that's what is a problem in a lot of, at least in two of the five boroughs. I don't know about the Bronx. I just don't get many clients there and in Staten Island, but it's not good um, to have that. I mean, I think it's a good idea to make a group be doing things according to code, et cetera. But if there's no Department of Buildings, I, I don't know what you're supposed to do. We have a new commissioner of the DOB. She just started about six weeks ago. So well, we're looking forward to some changes there. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Believe me, even in our council offices, we've experienced some of what you've experienced. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming in. Okay, we have been joined by Council Member Robert Cornegie. And our next panel is Kabir Chowdhury, uh, the Reverend Peter Cook, um, Alexandra Brandis, I think it is, and Frank Lang. Frank left, okay. Yes, we got it off, uh, on the, off the record, yeah. So we'll call up uh, Re Reverend Robert Fultz Merrison. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, please, yeah. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Kobir Chowdhury. I'm the president of Masjid al -Aman. I'm not the Imam, just for <laughs> clarification. <laughs> I have been mistaken. I, I feel actually very powerful right now, because I, I feel like I'm talking to the, the people. It's, it's an opportunity that is afforded to, to, to really, you know, I had s scripted something, but I, I just went off because I, I feel like I s need to speak from my heart. You know, our property was exempted from property tax for three decades or more. I was a child, 17 year old when I came. I, I've been part of this mosque and they have been exempted all the time. In 2010, they have had issues because you know, we are the most vulnerable community. We are first generation, we don't speak English, we are not educated, we are supporting a family here, we also left half of the family back home Many things contributes to our problems. That's why things don't get done in a normal phase. So property tax exemption was maintained up until 2000, well, it was maintained all the time. In 2010, they found out that they haven't been renewed for 10 years because people didn't know what to do and how to do it and they had other priorities. So I had, I think, um, controller was, uh, John Lou was the controller at that time. So we seek some help from their office. I filed the application, exemption was approved, and they retroactively reversed $328,000 for the whole time. 11, 12, 13, we renewed every year. Comes 2014, we were denied. Why? Because our building is not done. It's under construction. So somehow the, the state law doesn't allow it, but the city imposes it on us, saying that you have to, be, uh, uh, you have, to have a certified occupancy to, to be able to be exempted. So denied, we apply again, denied. And every time March 15 comes, it's a scary day for me. I'm in the admin from 2016. Then we have extended till May 1st, and I'm so happy that you could relate to this it's, it's how you tell the congregants who donate a dollar, 50 cents, or whatever they can, and they know that it's going on public record for lien to be sold. Property can be lost, somebody can auction it off. This is an investment from all, all generations that are living in this community for 30, 40 years. We don't know how to handle it. Thanks to our creator, Paula came around and she was the, the educated voice for us. She actually, she had helped us. I didn't know she was helping for a couple of years prior. But long story short, we are now squeezed with Department of Building violation, ECB violations, 
finance department is taking all of this against us, and we cannot complete the building because it was done, some of the things that we have done was in need of correction. We are repairing a new building. We have been constructing this building since 2001 under, um, under the same permit. So our situation is unique. And, and the same building under construction with the same usage, we are running under TPA, Temporary Public Assembly, with five, uh, with three live fire guards. I'm one of them. I trained. Imam is trained. Other people, five of us are trained. So every time we are having service, three of us have to be present. This is our condition. And I don't think it's going to improve. I'm going to be honest. Not in the next three months. Not in the next six months. Because we have to get the, we are, we are all together now. We are getting it done. We are getting the plumbing sign off. Uh, electric side no we are doing the we have done the the mechanical system we are very close but we're not there yet but when you come to this other hearing we went uh, about a month and a half ago you talk to the finance department i feel like their their heart is a little different i mean i i don't know i can't they can relate it to us i i feel like you know when i was part of uh, community education council in, in, in district 19 you know there's something called individualized education plan for a child that is in special need. We are in special need. Our circumstances, our problem cannot be solved with every other uh, notes and codes and, and situations. We, uh, and it's like I was saying, from the dusk and from the you know, early on, early prayer to the late prayer, we have six, 700 people participating on each prayer. We have to break them into different sessions. Well, is, it our, is it my fault that the community is growing? Is it my fault that our next generation, our children want to come to the mosque and not be on the street, you know, dealing drugs and selling or doing wrong things? It's not um, our fault that everybody's trying to participate and, and take part in the program that is making everybody better and, and building a better community together. So I, I feel like we need to be, I mean, every other nonprofit has unique situations, but our situation is, is very different, very unique, and we need to be treated with the uniqueness and kindness, and I'm so happy that I'm here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for Thank that you. testimony. It uh, was really emotional and heartfelt. And, and I have reached out to S Sebastian, tried to arrange a couple of meetings with that. I, I failed somehow. It didn't work out. Where do you live? Thank you. Where do you live? Ozone Park. We're in the borderline of uh, Queens and Brooklyn. OK. Uh, uh, Sebastian I work with Moin Chowdhury, and, and, and a lot of other people know you. Uh, yes. <laughs> Where are you from? What country? Thank you. Thank you very much again. What country? Uh, we're from Bangladesh. I thought so. Thank but uh, yes, in the Bangladeshi community, I have a lot of fans. So we'll try to work with you. Get a hold of Sebastian. Come, come visit us one day. You know, you'll see the mosque in the front. Yeah. It's like three three buildings demolished, but they're charging us three times because the buildings are not merged with the finance department. And we have over two million dollar in tax lien, that could be sold any time, and we could be losing everything. Is this the interest of the city? Is this the interest of the finance department? Who who's who is interested in that? Who's not interested in our community and our growth and our prosperity? We'll, we'll work with you on it. Yep. Thank you. Thank yep. you very much. Absolutely. Okay, next, please. I'm the Reverend Robert Fultz Morris, and I work with the Presbytery of New York City, which has 103 faith communities within the five boroughs of New York City. Some of them are as old as 350 years or more, began with before there were any kind of property issues around. So you can imagine, uh, as a spiritual leader, how many property issues I get to deal with on a regular basis. And I'm glad to be here before you. And I'm also glad to be um, speaking in support of the work that you're doing on legislation. And I also want to say that I, I don't feel like I'm speaking only for myself. There are somewhere between six to 8,000 religious organizations in New York City. Many of us, as my brother said here, are facing some of similar situations. And so we talk together to each other and uh, I do want to think of them as I'm with you here. There are two things that I want to lift up first um, that have already been lifted up. One is um, I do think that guidelines and having an ombuds person is going to be extremely important for two groups. One is that many of these religious organizations that I work with, that others work with, are, are staffed by volunteers. And the volunteers only have so many hours, so much time, Changes happen, as has been stated earlier, and communications don't always get done. But there's another group that I also want to bring to the city's attention, and that's the people that the volunteers and paid employees go to in the city structure that sometimes don't seem to know all the nuances of how religious groups work or even the nuances of what happens with 
um, all the city processes, because as they change, I don't know what happens down at the lowest level. To give you an example, one of our volunteers in the Bronx had to go more than 20 times to deal with a violation that was having fines. The fines, you know, are gonna next go to the Department of Finance, next go to lien. We got a property consultant that went in and said, um, well, the Presbytery owns this property. We wanna see the Presbytery property owner. We're a 13,000 member organization. We don't have an individual. So anyway, we, we finally went three levels up and got through to somebody who understands how a church system works like ours. So there's another group of people that need to be informed on how these issues work. The lastly is more of an encouragement to say, if you've never heard of the halo effect, um, I wanna bring to your attention, and it's in my report, that a study by Partners for Sacred Places and the, and the director of the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice found that the average urban historic sacred place generates over 1.7 million in economic impact annually. That's by hiring people, by purchasing supplies, and by countless volunteer hours that if they were put a dollar value, they'd be there. So when you take these kinds of nonprofits out of your community, you're taking economic value, as I think was already pointed out here. And so I wanna say that as we move forward, we move forward with you and wanting to work with you, remembering a, a prophet from uh, Jeremiah who once said, that as you seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf, in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And so we do need to work together. Our mutual welfare is important. Thank you. What a good way to end. <laughs> Thank you. Next, please. I wish to uh, thank the Finance Committee and its staff and the members who introduced these four bills we are here to talk about today. My name is Peter Cook, and I am the Executive Director of the New York State Council of Churches. The Council represents 7,000 congregations from eight partner denominations across the state of New York, including a couple thousand congregations within the city of New York. And some of those churches, as um, Bob referenced, um, have been here since the city's conception and have done much over the centuries to make the city what it is today. One dimension of the New York State Council's work is to work with congregations to improve, renovate, and add on to their buildings and property so that they can better serve their neighborhoods and the city as a whole. We want congregations which often have to deal with old buildings and deferred maintenance to think much more creatively about how they can access a wider variety of resources beyond what can be generated by their membership alone. We invite congregations to think about partnerships that can be used to do things like build affordable housing, construct schools, childcare centers, and medical clinics, food programs, and community gardens, and neighborhood meeting places. And so we are partners with the city to do economic and community development, which is inclusive of a wide variety of residents and does not seek to displace people from their neighborhoods through urban renewal or gentrification, but helps them to strive where they live. So given our historic and current missions <coughs> to the city and the challenges before us, um, we are very concerned as a council of churches about the burdens that are being placed on our congregations right now because of the way the um, city has set up these um, regulations and would like to see those changes. I'd also like to lift up the um, idea of the ombudsman, which we think is a really good idea. Um, somebody who understands congregations would be very helpful, um, but also that to work with other departments within the city which are seeking to partner with congregations to do creative things and to try to not just 
interpret regulations but also bring to congregations attention, resources that they might be able to utilize that would actually help to move their organizations forward and improve their property. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, please. Good afternoon. My name is Alexandra Brandes, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Manager at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today at this hearing considering Intro 1776 to streamline not-for-profit exemptions. We fully support Intro 1776. Despite legislation enacted in 1887 to receive exemption from water and sewer charges based on the benefit charitable organizations confer to society, it has become increasingly difficult to receive and maintain these exemptions. First, DEP requires recertifications every two years, a list of all contracts, and proof from each government contractor that none of them are providing water and sewer funding. This requirement is based on a 1970 legislative amendment and a mayoral executive order from 1980. In practice, it is very burdensome to recertify every two years, list every contract, and impossible to prove we are not getting water and sewer funding. It is impossible because since our inception, we've been exempted, and you can't get funding for something that isn't charged to you. And without an expense, um, sorry. Further, getting letters from every government funder is completely impossible and frankly a waste of time. Second, other nonprofits I've spoken to are losing long-standing exemptions even though their purpose and programs have remained the same. There have been two court cases on this issue and DEP's attempts to revoke long-standing exemptions were found arbitrary and capricious. Unfortunately, most not-for-profits cannot litigate this issue. So when they lose, they have to spend the money that is meant to go to homelessness, domestic violence, other vital services on water and sewer. Based on this, we are requesting you support the revocation of Executive Order 43, investigate the exemptions lost in the past several years to correct any arbitrary revocations, develop a more transparent, fair, and consistent process for exemptions going forward, and create the opportunity for all not-for-profits to receive an exemption based on the enormous public benefit they provide to our city. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. I'm, I could relate to your story. I just finished back in March, uh, four year and a half year process in building our con uh, building, our sanctuary, and uh, I tell you what I'm thinking of doing here, which is uh, somehow pass legislation, introduce legislation, and we'll have to talk to the staff and see how we could draft this, that it's, it's a little, it's, 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 as a matter of fact, in considering a building, you have to consider, do I want to build because then they're not gonna give me my tax status during that time, which is gonna cost me more money to do it. It's safer just to keep it the way it is right now. And so I, I think that uh, we need to have some legislation uh, because it makes no sense. If I'm the nonprofit, I'm saying I, meaning the organization, uh, and we are doing the construction, we do it as a nonprofit. We get donation as a nonprofit. We do everything as a nonprofit. Nothing has changed except I'm trying to build this building to do exactly what you said, to, to help our young people. And I know you're ready to explode, so I, I better let you speak. Go ahead. Right, that was a question for me. We are in the process, we're in the middle of litigating this point. Okay. So as, as uh, the president, Colbert, pointed out earlier, we had, a, we had a hearing recently before the tax commission, and that is the center of the case. It is simply not the Department of Finance's job to be enforcing anything re with relation to the building code. State law is very clear on this. If we lose at the tax commission, we will go to the court. If something weird happens there, we will be back to you Please. to say we need a bill. But hopefully we're gonna get a nice clear decision. We got a very clear decision from the tax commission uh, about the fact that they can't penalize groups because their capital campaigns take a long time mm -hmm. earlier this summer. Now we've discovered a new problem, which is that the new administration of the tax commission have decided that their decisions don't have precedential value 
and they're refusing to publish them. The old general counsel, I'm in touch with him, for the tax commission, he used to just put them in books, and then you could come to the library at the tax commission and look at them, and if something was useful to your case, you could use it. They don't do that anymore, and they don't publish them anywhere online. Um, and I, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm, and I know I'm speaking to a couple of attorneys up there, just because they don't have precedential value. Nothing has precedential value if you're in the same level of court. It only becomes precedential if you go above. That doesn't mean it's not something you might want to show the judge. But so they're making those decisions impossible to find. And we have been told impermissibly that in order to use a good decision we got for one client in another client's case, we need the first client's written permission, which is monkers. Wow. So we could use some help on that. That's in my nice notes that say thank you to the people I'm really mad at right now. So but do I, read to the last page. I, I, I've, been, <laughs> I've been here for 10 years, and I know this court cases and so forth. I like to get things coded. I like, I like, I like it to come into law, because once it's into law, it protects, uh, it enables uh, for organizations not to go through what you have gone through, and we find this in every type of houses of worship that go through this process in trying to better the community. <laughs> this is the thing, you're trying to do something good. I know that's frustration of all of you that you have up here. It's like we're trying to do things literally often for free. You know, we're doing a lot of free stuff uh, for the city, and I guess no good deed goes unpunished, and those days uh, need to come to an end. I give it back to my co-chair. Well said, okay. Thank you very much to this panel. We're now gonna call up the next panel. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, MJ Okma, Human Services Council of New York. Uh, Lenora, Lemoria, Awadi, L. Sorry if I messed up your name. And Lucy Sexton. Yes. Up to yeah, let's see who's over there. Is MJ here? Okay. Lucy? And Lamoria? Oh, that's you. Okay. So Lucy's not here. Okay, thank you. Why don't you start? Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is MJ Okuma, and I am the policy and campaign strategist for the Human Services Council. We're a membership organization of 170 human services providers here in New York City. Um, both intro 1784 and 1799 aim to streamline information for nonprofits, which is a positive goal. Uh, however, providing educational resources and assistance for nonprofits will not address the needs of the, human, of the city's human services sector. The main issue facing the sector is not a lack of understanding of city policies and contracting processes. It's chronic underfunding and unfunded mandates. Uh, most recently last week, the council passed intro 1321C without a fiscal analysis of its impact on human services con contracts and without pairing its passage with the appropriate budget increases to cover its mandated cost. And while the indirect funding initiative established in the fiscal 20 budget was a major step forward on the path towards right-sizing human services contracts, providers that pri providers are deeply thankful for, uh, more work needs to be done on this issue. Uh, the truth is we need fundamental change to address, to address the unfunded contracts and in, that impact services across the city and stifle the wages of the human services workforce. Um, currently, city contracts knowingly provide inadequate rates per service unit and do not provide cost escalations for OTPS or guarantee cost of living increases for the workforce. Because of this, the nonprofit human services workforce has borne the brunt of this underfunding. This is, in effect, an indirect government workforce, and yet they're some of the lowest compensated workers in, the New, York, in New York's economy. In New York City, the human services workforce is 82% women and 80% people of color, and they're making significantly less than those outside the sector with similar credentials. 
these low and stagnant wages also lead to chronic staffing issues as providers struggle to hire and maintain qualified staff. The chronic underfunding and unfunded mandates imposed on the sector has led to an environment where organizations across the city are being forced to scale back services or consolidate just to survive, and the workforce is dramatically underpaid for their labor. Establishing an office or a guidebook for, for nonprofits create positive resources, and we are in support of these intentions. But it must be stressed that both of them fall short in a system that is setting up those same human services organizations for failure by not covering the true cost of providing quality services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. I'm just going to go to the next person, and then we'll have some questions. Good afternoon. My name is Lemuria Alawodeo. I am the Associate Vice President of Strengthen NYC at United Way of New York City, an organization that works with hundreds of nonprofit organizations in New York City. I'm here to share our thoughts regarding Intro 1784, which would establish an office for not-for-profit services. For 80 years, the United Way of New York City has worked to support vulnerable New Yorkers throughout the five boroughs. We do this by partnering with community-based organizations, schools, businesses, and government agencies to address immediate and long-term needs around education and financial stability. United Way is currently working with over 700 nonprofit organizations across the city. We pay co close attention to the needs of the nonprofit community in New York. When the executive director of a multi-service organization shares challenges they're experiencing, we connect them to potential supports. When a food pantry is looking for extra hands to provide services, we leverage our corporate partnerships to find volunteers. When an organization needs to invest in infrastructure upgrades to better serve the local community, we provide operating grants to strengthen and build capacity. Our aim is to ensure that the nonprofit organizations are stable, strong, and well positioned to improve outcomes for New Yorkers. We commend the City Council for seeking further, non for further support for nonprofit organizations across the city. These organizations fill an important role in providing critical social services for New Yorkers, often leveraging funding from city, state, and federal government. Ensuring that there's ongoing two-way communication and collaboration between the nonprofit organizations and the city is essential. In addition, we also offer the following considerations for strengthening the nonprofit sector in New York City. One, address the chronic underfunding of nonprofit organizations. Nonprofits need adequate and timely funding for their work. According to a report by Sea Change Capital Partners and Oliver, Oliver Wyman, about 40% of nonprofit organizations in New York City have cash operating reserves of less than two months. This means they have a minimal amount of resources to cover immediate expenses and almost no margin for investments. Delayed payments for social service contracts create financial burdens. As uh, last January, Controller Stringer's office released a report showing that 89% of human services contracts in 2018 were sent to the Comptroller for certification after the contract start date. In April, Sea Change Capital Partners found that social service contracts were registered an average of 221 days after their start date, an estimate, an, um, an estimate that the financial burden on nonprofits registration delays add up to as much as $774 million. Even when funding is received, it does not cover the full cost of providing services, requiring nonprofits to fill the gaps by fundraising from private resources and foregoing essential needs. This directly contributes to low or stagnant wages for the human services workforce. An annual pay for a human services worker in New York City is $29,000 far below the income needed to make ends meet. Low wages in the sector primarily affect women. Over 80% of human, service, human services workforce are women, and 44% are women of color. Nonprofit organizations need additional opportunities to secure unrestricted operating funds and allow them to make the needed investments in infrastructure or systems. These kinds of investments increase nonprofit capacity and increase inefficiencies, but remain out of reach for many organizations. We need to streamline processes to ease administrative burden. Over decades of working with nonprofit organizations, we have witnessed the administrative challenges that organizations experience when applying for government contracts, contracting with the city, or submitting reports. Organizations work with multiple agencies sometimes have to submit separate reports through different portals every year. 
for organizations that are dependent on government funding, this process takes multiple days of staff time that could otherwise be spent delivering services. Reporting or monitoring requirements can sometimes force organizations to duplicate efforts. We know many nonprofit organizations that spend a lot of effort reporting to various agencies, sometimes each with their own data system, effectively submitting the same data in different formats. We've also heard from nonprofit organization staff that they wrestle with inefficiencies. They don't feel like they have the opportunities to propose solutions. Some organizations are so dependent on city funding that they're afraid to voice their concerns. Any new structure supports must consider the power dynamics between the city and the nonprofit organizations. We must find opportunities to address the challenges. At the same time that nonprofit organizations are experiencing financial challenges, the need for services remains very high. Every four years, we, United Way, in collaboration with other partners, develops the New York City Self-Sufficiency Standard, which reviews the cost of living in the city and who is struggling to make ends meet. Last year, report shows that 40% of New Yorkers working families are not making enough income to meet their basic needs of housing, childcare, food, healthcare, transportation, and miscellaneous items. Nonprofit organizations exist to serve this large share of New Yorkers and contribute to a stronger, more resilient city. We encourage the city to find innovative solutions for addressing challenges that nonprofits face. Chronic underfunding, increasing costs of doing business, and unmet demand for services will not be addressed by incremental improvements. What we need are bold actions that are designed together with the nonprofit community and that are responsive to the needs of New Yorkers and the organizations that serve them. Understanding the experience of the people working in nonprofit organizations is critical for designing solutions that make a difference. The city must learn from nonprofit organizations. It must do this in a way that compensates people for the time they spend sharing their insights and addresses the power dynamics at play between funders and, grantee and grantees. The Sea Change Capital Report identifies recruiting and retention issues and rising real estate costs at some of the, and some of the, as some of the persistent challenges for nonprofits. The city could help design innovative approaches to strengthen the sector by focusing on the most impactful issues, for example, around retaining staff or securing affordable space. We thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts on the challenges facing nonprofits in New York City and believe that investing in organizations that serve New York City is the right action to improve the lives of no low-income New Yorkers for the benefit of all. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, in the uh, last budget negotiations, we um, uh, included an uh, increase in the indirect rate for nonprofits. Um, and it's supposed to be released uh, by the November plan, which we think is coming out the end of this week, beginning of next week. Um, and then that should be carried through to the 2021 budget. Um, I mean, I don't know what's included in that. Nobody has included me in the, those negotiations at this point. But um, we're hopeful that that's going to be able to at least provide you with some relief. Uh, yeah, so the portal for um, nonprofits to be able to file for their indirect rates just opened yesterday. So that's, that's in the process, and we're confident that I'm that's... I'm sorry, can you just repeat it? It's so hard to hear. Sorry. Uh, the portal for nonprofits to file for their indirect rates actually opened yesterday, and we're confident that that process is currently going smoothly. Um, and that is feel, filling in a major hole in human services contracts, but it doesn't address issues of other than personnel services and um, personnel services, which are also underfunded. Okay, so I think we're looking forward to continuing to work on those issues with you, because we recognize in the council how important it is to, you know, fund you properly at the right levels and the, the amount of services that you provide to New Yorkers. So I, I know that that's a, a priority for us. Yes, and thank you so much for your support of the indirect investment and the work that you've done on this. It really has made a difference. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. All right, good, we're, we're with you, and thank you very much for coming in and uh, for participating in today's hearing. And with that, we're going to adjourn uh, at, um, oh my goodness, 10 minutes to five, 4.50 in the afternoon.